guys, everyone. I decided to come to the church and to look around and let you look around at the space that we love and are missing so much. And you may be hearing something in the background, so there's gonna be another surprise in just a moment. Hope you're having a good weekend. I miss you all so much. Can't wait till we can be together again. I'll let you take a look at the pictures that we love so much on the walls. surprise. I want to thank Nancy Munn so much for meeting me at the church and we stayed a safe distance from each other and for her bringing that beautiful offering for us this morning for Easter Sunday. And now for the message. It's going to be a, um, a different time for us this Easter Sunday, isn't it? Uh, we're so used to going to church and it's one of the most uh, well-attended day is probably the most well attended day that and Christmas Eve of the church year for any church and um, it's kind of funny there's a lot of pressure put on preachers for those two sermons and they're sermons that deal with such familiar scripture that it's kind of hard to come up with something new every year and one of my friends and colleagues um, sends out an email to all of us preachers every year and says don't stress too much over it because it's really not about you 
and basically grace abound. So um, that's kind of different this year to be thinking of messages and knowing that that I'm just giving them by myself. <laughs> so we're all feeling a little bit different this year, I know, but um, actually we're probably given the opportunity to think about Easter morning and to have some of the same feelings Easter morning that uh, Mary and the disciples had that very first Easter morning. I'm sure that they would not uh, understand probably the big fanfare that we have. That probably wouldn't look like what they remember on that early morning. Um, after Jesus died and was taken down from the cross, they would have, um, they took him and put him in a tomb and that would have been um, normal custom. In fact, there was a whole process around death and burial that you might find interesting from the ancient Mediterranean culture. See, they looked at death a little bit different than we do, and it was sort of a process for them. The, the, the person would die, the body would die, they would lay them in a, a tomb, in a cave, and they would begin a year-long mourning process. And so while they were mourning for the year, they believed that their loved one, as they were decomposing, that they were also, um, I guess you might use the word, being sanctified and ready for the resurrection that they believed would come at some point. See, they believed that um, sin was embedded in the actual flesh of a person, and that while they were decomposing, that the sins were also dissolving. And they had a year-long process because they believed that that's about as long as it took for the body to decompose. And then at the end of that year, they would remove the bones from the tomb. And oftentimes, they would put them in another box called a bone box or an ossuary. And they were smaller, just about the length of the longest, the femur. And they would... Um, then they would bury those and they would be that would be the end of their mourning process and then they would bury those the ossuary or bury the bone box and sometimes they would put inkwells in the bone box because they believe that god would weave a new body around these bones and inscribe almost like a scroll would inscribe a new story to this person and some another visual they had was of a of a loom that the bones kind of served as the, as the loom and god would weave a new body with these bones so that's why it really would matter to mary when she went to the tomb and found it empty because if the tomb was empty if someone had robbed and uh, robbed the tomb and taken jesus's body then they would be deprived of this time of mourning and they would believe that that Jesus's body would have been deprived of this um, de decomposition time and this sanctification time so you can see why um, initially because they didn't realize what was going on why that would be so terrifying and dismaying for them that who would have who would do that that's just insult on injury on top of killing their beloved teacher and that would be one reason why she would look at who she thought was the gardener and say, please give me the body. I'll, I'll take it and take care of it. I'll be responsible for it. And then when Jesus says to Mary, um, calls Mary by her name, says Mary, then, then her eyes and her heart are open. And I love that because it reminds us that, that God knows each one of us um, by name and he knows each one of our hearts. And um, that we're that dear to God that and that we if we're if we'll listen if we'll be open to it we can hear God calling us in our lives and <clears throat> that's the reason I always think that you know if you're stressed then you should listen to your breath because that's God calling you individually uniquely um, every time that you breathe that that's God's yes for you so it would be natural for Mary to be so relieved when she did recognize Jesus that she would think, okay, now everything's going to get back to normal. And, um, and I'm sure that they had wished everything would, would go back to the way it was before Jesus was arrested and crucified. And I think that this year we have a unique opportunity to really be able to understand that frustration and that desire for things to go back to the way that they used to be. Um, 
don't you want things to go back to the way, way they were in February, um, back to when we just thought nothing of going to the store or going to a restaurant, having meals with one another, back when we um, probably took for granted all the hugs that we got to give one another. But um, I'm sure that she felt such relief when she looked at him and thought, okay, good, now we can go back to the way it was. And Jesus' reaction, like, don't cling on me, don't touch me, would have been rather jarring to her. But the thing is, is that she was being given a good lesson in, in true resurrection. You know, earlier in Jesus' life, when he resurrected, they call it a resurrection with Lazarus. He, he went and resurrected him when he was dead in the tomb and that, is it Lazarus got up and, and he lived out the rest of his life. But if you think about it, that's really more of a resuscitation. Um, when resurrection happens, there is something new, new life going on. And so when Jesus was resurrected, he was resurrected as the Christ and there would be something new. They could never go back to the way it used to be. And there would be something more expansive, something more universal, something that would um, empower all of them. You might remember he had also told the disciples and told them that they would do greater things than him. He had plans for them. And what they couldn't possibly understand at this point was that they would be called to become Christ into the world and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that. So Jesus was pulling Mary forward even though she couldn't possibly understand um, what that meant. And I'm sure that she would have rather just had him say, okay, things can be like they used to be. Again, that's where we have a unique opportunity this Easter is to, to allow ourselves to be open to what will come. No matter when they open the restaurants again and people start to go back to work again and children go back to school, um, we may wish that it would be like it was before, but it won't be. It won't be because we've all been changed somewhat. Life is different. We've, we've been through something that no one in, in the world that's alive today has ever been through before. And when we come through the other side, we'll, we'll be different. Now the question will be, will we fight that and have our knee-jerk reaction just to go back to the way it used to be, just business as usual? Like perhaps maybe we have an opportunity to uh, repace ourselves. Maybe not jump right into the frenetic activity that we were a part of before. Maybe, maybe make choices about what we do with our time. Maybe the question that we can ask ourselves now is, what do we want life to look like? Um, you know, before this happened, there was so much division and so much political strife and so much inequality um, with income and, and health care, all kinds of things that have been revealed through this, but also we've been given an opportunity to, to look at those divisions and say, well, what's really important is that we're all human and we're all connected to one another. So maybe this is an opportunity where God can show us a better way to move forward. And just like with the disciples, what they would be called to do would require courage and selflessness and vulnerability and a willingness to look beyond themselves, I think we'll be called to do the same thing. And the answer, the question is, are we willing? And as we each come to these answers in our own hearts and we collectively as a people of this nation and other nations, as we, as we consider those things and make decisions for ourselves, they will matter they will matter and I think one of the different one of the biggest differences will be is um, we've got an opportunity for this challenge that we're going through for the losses that have been incurred for families that have lost loved ones and people that have lost jobs and incomes 
and the hardships that have come about from this virus and we as a collective people of the world have gone through if we allow if we allow ourselves to be transformed through this process if we open our hearts to what god is calling us to a new thing a resurrected thing then we can come through it um, being stronger and better so what we decide individually will add to the collective. So my prayer is that I will have the courage to, to really be evaluating my life and, and looking at places where I need transformation. I need resurrection. I need to look at things in a new way, more the way that God intended for it to be. Because that's, that's the other thing about Easter is that it calls us back to creation. When God said, let it be, and it was good, and it was good. Jesus' resurrection calls us back to the creation, but creation is always calling us to a new thing. A thing that's more expanded and full of love, where all will mutually, mutually flourish. So my prayer for you is that you will also be thinking about these things in the days to come too. And that this Easter Sunday will be a time of uh, contemplation about what new resurrection might look like in your life too. And may you always remember in this process that you have been wonderfully and fearfully made by the Creator God, and that in the Christ you have been lovingly redeemed, and you're empowered today and each day going forward to live into the new creation, to be transformed in grace. God bless you and go in peace.